have certain rules I live by. My first rule, I don't believe anything the government tells me. Our Constitution is a remarkable, beautiful gift. long survey conducted by the Pew Research Center shows that in the early 1960s, 75% of the American population trusted the federal government. The same study shows that today, that number has dwindled to only 20%. The story you're about to hear is a prime example of why. same reason it's because we know in our gut that something is horribly wrong meet Schaefer Cox the liberty loving patriotism preaching political prisoner that you've probably never heard of before he caught the attention of the FBI and other federal entities by all accounts Schaefer Cox was an upstanding citizen and a pillar of the community Son of a Baptist minister, Schaefer Cox was raised with conservative Christian values. He enjoyed hunting and fishing and taking advantage of all the outdoor adventure Alaska had to offer. By his early 20s, Schaefer was an accomplished businessman operating his small construction company there in Fairbanks, Alaska, making an honest living. Ever mindful of his civic duty, Schaefer wanted to make a difference. In 2008, he spoke at the Alaska Republican Convention. He had command of the crowd, and the highly respected lieutenant governor spontaneously asked him to run for office from the convention floor, so he did. He came in second place in the Republican primary with 38% of the vote in the three-way race. People are, are asking for some direction and for some leadership and for some solutions that they can do because they figured out that voting doesn't work. They figured out that sending letters to your congressman doesn't work. And they're grasping for what's the next option. He continued to speak at events across Alaska and other states. Schaefer talked a lot about the Constitution and about liberty and freedom. He covered a wide range of topics including the Federal Reserve, Federal Overreach, and yes, the Second Amendment. Pushing for the uh, first and foremost, the Alaska Firearms Freedom Act. It's a declaratory piece of legislation that says a firearm or a firearm accessory or ammunition that's manufactured within the state and stays in the state is none of the federal government's jurisdiction under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. He was becoming a fast-rising star in the Liberty Movement, and although the crowds were getting larger and larger, his message remained the same. The government should obey the Constitution, the document it refers to as the supreme law of the land. God gave every man the right to life, liberty, and property, a corresponding obligation to defend those rights. We delegate that responsibility, not entirely, but in part, to a government to do what we have a natural right to do, which is to protect them. But they've become a liability to that. It's nobody's job but our own to make sure that the government doesn't become detrimental to the purpose which we created it. We have no obligation to submit to a government that refuses to submit to uh, their governing document. But Schaefer didn't just talk, he acted. He started groups like the Liberty Bell System. The Liberty Bell System is an automatic phone system where every freedom lover in in Fairbanks can be instantly accessible to the others. Here's how it works. If you are being harmed by anyone who is breaking one of these laws, you can ring the Liberty Bell, just call the Liberty Bell operator who will then send a message instantly to thousands of people in Fairbanks who are willing to assist you. The Second Amendment Task Force. The way that this got started was uh, several weeks ago, I was doing a radio show and I wasn't even talking about firearms. I was talking about economics. But somebody called the station after the, the show was over and said, hey, what are we going to do about all these, these firearms restrictions that just keep coming down the pipe? It's like they just never end. And I said, well, I don't know. Let's get together and uh, talk about it at Denny's on Monday night. And 150 people showed up. And I was expecting maybe 18 or 20. A week later, we only had a week to organize, but we found a place big enough to meet. And we wound up with 
700 people. And the Alaska Peacemakers Militia. You know what the militia is? The militia is anybody with a gun and a conscience. It's anybody who, who values their freedom and the freedom of their neighbor. It's somebody who's, who's, who's got that sense of duty to their fellow countrymen. It's beautiful and it's right and it's good. And there are 3,500 armed, well-trained men under my command in Fairbanks right now. And they are... FBI agent Richard Sutherland, it was those words that drew the attention of the FBI. Where could Schaefer Cox have gotten the crazy idea that it was okay to create a well-regulated militia? Well, for those of you that don't know, that idea is straight out of the supreme law of the land, the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America. It was at that point that the FBI hired career criminal Gerald J.R. Olson to try to get some dirt on Schaefer Cox. Not only did the feds give money to Olson, they also helped him out of some legal trouble he had for stealing a tractor. Here's a clip of Olson describing some of his past criminal history in court. Who are you transporting drugs for on those two occasions you talked about? It was the Hells Angels Biker Club gang. After over a year of investigation, two separate U.S. attorneys reviewed the FBI's findings and both came to the same conclusion. Schaefer Cox was not a threat and there should be no legal action. The FBI should have dropped it right then and there, but they didn't. Instead, they decided to try a different tactic. Provocation. Knowing full well that Schaefer's young son, Seth, was loved and well taken care of, the FBI called in a tip to the Office of Children's Services hoping to incite a shootout, according to witnesses. At the same time, the feds deployed paid informant William Drop Zone Bill Fulton under the direction of FBI Special Agent Sandra Klein to, among other things, goad Cox along and convince him that he needed to take a stand and defend his son from the government at all costs. The plan was to provoke the peacekeeper to violence and set the stage for a shootout. What the supervising agent had said, quote, our plan is to try to take Seth away from Schaefer and Martin. And we believe that will be sufficient to elicit a display of force, at which point we will shoot all three of them. After repeated unsuccessful attempts to convince Schaefer to commit violence, Fulton went from provocation to intimidation. Fulton went as far as threatening Cox's life and admittedly put a knife to the throat of Schaefer's friend Les Zerby during a meeting with Zerby and Cox and outright demanded, knife in hand, that Cox come up with a plan to murder officials. And I'm like, look, Les, what's your plan? He's like, well, we don't have a plan. And I just lost it. I literally grabbed it and I started coming over the counter and I was like, Suspecting foul play by the FBI, OCS, and other agencies, and fearing for their lives from drop zone Bill Fulton, Schaefer Cox and his wife went to the military police station at Fort Wainwright outside of Fairbanks. Military policeman Stephen Gibson told Schaefer that federal agents had come into the station and bragged about how they were going to, quote, fix the Schaefer Cox problem. In light of all this, Schaefer decided the best thing to do would be to leave town. With his wife and kids in tow, Schaefer was headed out of Fairbanks to Canada when FBI informant J.R. Olson stole the battery out of Cox's vehicle. With the vehicle successfully sabotaged, informant Olson tricked Schaefer and his family into taking refuge from informant Bill Fulton in Olson's attic until he could supposedly get his trucker friend to safely transport the Cox family to Canada. Olson kept the Cox family in his attic under false pretenses for 21 days, which met all the legal requirements for kidnapping, according to attorney Robert John, and gave the feds plenty of time to plan their strategy. On March 10, 2011, Olson took Schaefer to a deserted industrial lot in Fairbanks, where the trucker was supposedly waiting, but instead the FBI ambushed and arrested Schaefer Cox. It's worth mentioning that this case was first tried at the state level where the case was thrown out, but the feds had an axe to grind and he was instantly re-indicted on a federal level. 
the Justice Department knew it was going to take a very specialized prosecution team to obtain a conviction. Luckily, they knew just who to appoint to Schaefer Cox's case. Meet Joseph Bettini. Bettini first made headlines as a federal prosecutor after his unconstitutional and illegal activity in the case of Senator Ted Stevens. United States District Judge Emmett Sullivan said that in his 25-year career he had never seen mishandling and misconduct like what he had seen by the Justice Department prosecutors who tried Stevens' case. Bottini and his co-conspirator prosecutors were held in contempt for their deceptive and illegal tactics, which included withholding exculpatory evidence, evidence that favored the defense, and allowing false testimony. Judge Sullivan ordered special counsel Henry Schulke to investigate Joseph Bettini and the other federal prosecutors in Senator Stevens' case. It was only months before Schaefer's trial started that special counsel Schulke testified before Congress about the entire sordid affair of Senator Stevens' prosecution. The thing that disturbs me so greatly is not that this prosecution involved a United States senator because I doubt we would be having this hearing if it involved a, uh, a citizen who was not a United States Senator. And that disturbs me greatly. And how do we, how do we know? How does uh, any citizen know that the Department of Justice won't abide by uh, similar prosecutorial misconduct uh, in the future? Senator Stevens, loved and respected by his constituents, had an honorable 40-year-long service as the Republican senator from Alaska until a corrupt faction of the Justice Department unleashed this team of federal prosecutors, Joseph Bettini in particular, who destroyed his name and his career. Even far-left Democrats were able to muster a tiny bit of outrage. Uh, this is uh, some pretty... conduct by the prosecutors, I think. Uh, they're just appalling. One, one thing I'd like to know, first of all, do you think that what the prosecutors did is, uh, uh, you know, is it illegal? I think uh, what occurred in this case in a number of instances was a violation of an obligation imposed by the courts. And so, using your term uh, broadly, I would have to say it was illegal. Unfortunately, the illegal actions of Bettini and his co-workers were enough to secure a guilty verdict only eight days before the election, and Senator Ted Stevens narrowly lost. I look only forward, and I still see the day when I can remove the cloud that currently surrounds me. Sadly, Senator Stevens never got the chance to clear his name because he died only months later in a questionable plane crash. The outrage and public scrutiny surrounding the Stevens case still lingered as Schaefer Cox's federal trial got underway less than a year later. Sensing that perhaps Bettini had lost all credibility, the Justice Department named Steve Scrocky as co-prosecutor. Scrocky, equally complicit but perhaps less adept at judicial misconduct, would become the face of the prosecution. Joseph Bettini frequently whispered instructions to Scrocky throughout the entire trial, and as if from a playbook, the same tactics that Judge Sullivan had been so angered by in the Ted Stevens case were employed time and time again in the Schaefer Cox case. Withhold exculpatory evidence, allow false testimony, rinse, and repeat. Out of the hundreds of hours of recorded audio that the paid informants collected, you would think they contained a smoking gun. As it turns out, for some strange reason, the prosecutors asked the judge to make all the tapes inadmissible. They wanted their own surveillance kept secret, all of it except the clips they cherry-picked. Another blatant example of withholding exculpatory evidence. Subsequently released audio recordings and emails between co-prosecutor Steve Scrocky and U.S. Attorney Karen Loeffler, Scrocky's boss, show that Scrocky coached his witnesses to lie, then backed up the lies with his closing arguments. Another blatant example of allowing false testimony. The entire case was built primarily on the testimony of career criminal and conman J.R. Olson, knife-wielding provocateur Bill Fulton, and cherry-picked, out-of-context evidence. In the end, their playbook proved successful, and Schaefer Cox was found guilty of conspiracy to kill federal agents. 
it turns out there's a special place that the DOJ sends people with, in their own words, inspirational significance. It's called the Communications Management Unit, or CMU. It says, says inspirational significance. I think that's a very benign way of saying that the people are there because of their political beliefs. Only one journalist, William Potter, has ever been allowed in the CMU. There are two CMUs. One was opened inside the prison in Terre Haute, Indiana, and the other is inside this prison in Marion, Illinois. Neither of them underwent the formal review process that is required by law when they were opened. As a result, Potter wound up on an FBI watch list. Fortunately, Schaefer Cox was able to file an appeal with the Federal Ninth Circuit Court. The first hearing of the appeal was held just days ago on August 16, 2017 in Anchorage, Alaska. At that time, the judges heard oral arguments and had some interesting questions for the prosecution represented by Steve Scrocky. If soliciting someone to kill someone who doesn't exist isn't sufficient, under FIOLA, under whatever, if that, if that is not enough, what other evidence is there of solicitation specifically? Can you cite me or the panel to any case that have facts analogous to this? I think if we would have found it, we would have provided it to you, Your Honor. Exactly. There isn't any such case, is there? No. So you're effectively asking us to either to make new law or conclude there's not sufficient evidence on this point, right? Suppose I have a direct intention to kill Mickey Mouse, and I go solicit somebody to kill Mickey Mouse. Well, there's no Mickey Mouse to kill. Can you still have a solicitation? Hopefully this video can help spread the word about the prosecutorial and investigative misconduct in the Schaefer-Cox case. As Senator Cornyn feared, How does uh, any citizen know that the Department of Justice won't abide by uh, similar prosecutorial misconduct uh, in the future? Although the appellate judges did show skepticism, and rightly so, make no mistake about it, even though there is overwhelming evidence in Schaefer's favor, getting his conviction overturned is going to be an uphill battle. He needs your help. If this could happen to Schaefer, it could happen to you. At the very least, please share this video. No matter your political viewpoint, we can all agree that innocent people should not be imprisoned. Please help spread the word about Schaefer's case. His children need their father home. You can find various links and information in the description of this video. Please share this video and please pray for the release of Schaefer Cox. I am Ray Southwell, co-founder of the Michigan Militia in 1994 and co-founder of the Alaska Citizens Militia in 2009. We helped Schaefer Cox in establishing a constitutional militia in Fairbanks, Alaska. He is not a domestic terrorist. He is not a criminal. And there is no justice in America, it is just us. I'm Joe Burlack, owner and host of the Patriot Watch Radio Network based out of Ohio. My crew and I thoroughly support Schaefer Cox 110%. Our crew and myself as well as our network will continue to support Schaefer Cox in any way that we possibly can. God bless you, Schaefer. Hi, I'm Pastor Broden, and I'm the senior pastor here at the Fair Park Bible Fellowship Church. I stand full support of Francis Schaefer Cox. Release him now. Hello, this is Ruth. I believe Schaefer Cox is innocent, and I believe he should be released. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Wiley Smeed Drake. I'm the chairman of the Congressional Prayer Conference in Washington, D.C., and one of the key notes in our prayer meeting is to pray for Schaefer Cox. He is being persecuted and prosecuted unrighteously, illegally. Continue to pray with us and for us as we support Schaefer Cox. My name is Rudy Davis, and I am also a Bible-believing follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have also researched the, Sch the Schaefer Cox case. I believe he was set up just like they set up Senator Ted Stevens. And I am in full support of freedom for Schaefer Cox. Thank you for your prayers.
Hi everyone, it's Sheila Zelensky from the Sheila Zelensky Show. I have had several people on my show regarding Schaefer Cox. I believe he's being wrongly imprisoned. I believe he's being targeted by the federal government. And we do have to pray for our brothers in bonds. And I ask you to speak out on the Schaefer Cox issue. Thank you and God bless. My name's Rich Drew.